All right, we're now talking about Chapter 6 for Biology 246, Anatomy and Physiology, Concordia University, on the integumentary system. Uh, so with the integumentary system, we're talking about uh, that system whereby it's the integument, which is the skin, covers the body and consists of the skin and its derivatives or its accessory tissues, nails, hair, sweat, glands, uh, sebaceous glands. Uh, and uh, the skin, also known as the cutaneous membrane, uh, is a barrier to the outside world. It's a visual indicator of our physiology and health. Oftentimes we gauge how healthy someone is, whether they're old or young, based on what we see with the skin, which isn't always the best thing from an aesthetic standpoint socially, but there's no question that does have some relationship. Uh, of course, dermatology is the scientific study and treatment of skin. Uh, things you should be able to do uh, with this section uh, for the integument on the composition and the functions of the integument. Be able to describe the five layers or strata of the uh, epidermis, differentiate between thick skin and thin skin, explain what causes differences in skin color, characterize the two layers of the dermis, and explain the significance of cleavage lines, describe how dermal blood vessels function in temperature regulation, list the functions of the subcutaneous layer, name ways in which the epidermis protects the body and prevents water loss, and describe the integument's involvement in calcium and phosphorus utilization, uh, describe the integument's role in secretion and absorption, Identify the immune cells that reside in the integument, describe their actions, and explain how skin kilt helps cool the body or retain warmth, and listen sensations detected by the skin's sensory receptors. So, there are two layers of the integument. The epidermis, uh, which is the most superficial layer, uh, or, yeah, superficial layer of the uh, skin. It's carotenized and stratified squamous epithelium, essentially. And the dermis is a deeper layer. It's primarily dense, irregular connective tissue. Uh, and additionally, the subcutaneous layer below it, which is not technically part of the integument, is referred to as the hypodermis. It's a layer of areolar and C tissue, uh, connective tissue, and uh, it's not part of the integumentary system. Okay. So layers of the integument, let's get a closer look here. So we have, of course, the integument being everything above that subcutaneous layer from what you see on your outer skin layer uh, and then deeper down toward just below that subcutaneous layer. We have the epidermis being the uppermost, most superficial layer of the dermis below it. And uh, the most superficial of the dermis is the papillary layer, and in particular is deeper. And then when we're looking at our sweat pores, you can see one here, sweat pore coming out of this American, American sweat gland, where actually where our sweat comes from. Uh, the epidermal ridge here, the difference between or look, uh, where the dermis and the epidermis essentially meet. The dermal papilla uh, right up here. Okay? Uh, rectal pili muscle, which is the one that's actually giving that sensation at your uh, for the hairs, the, at the hair follicle, or the hair root here in this case, uh, and actually helping be able to uh, draw some response, right? Uh, sebaceous or oil glands here attached to this hair. Uh, sweat gland duct here, the duct of that merocrine gland. And then uh, down below, of course, here, close to, to be kind of the main part is the lower level of the dermis, uh, but it cause extends upward to the, uh, all the way up to the papillary level of the dermis uh, with our veins, blue, of course, lacking oxygen, and artery being oxygenated, oxygenated why they are red. Uh, so the epithelium of the integument, epidermis. Again, it's carotenized, stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, It'll actually look more columnar at the lower levels, uh, more deeper levels of the uh, strata for the epidermis. And of course, it becomes more and more flattened as you get closer to the surface. Uh, as this, those uh, carotenized cells, essentially, uh, basically, when they're, when they're alive, then of course, they're not. They also get flattened, not only because of where they are in terms of the layers themselves, but you know they're no longer living cells as they become near that superficial layer or they move toward it. So layers of the strata from deep superficial, uh, basal, sp spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum, all the stratum. And uh, the, one of the better things I heard someone say uh, to help remember that is come, let's get sunburned. Okay? From the outer layer, the most superficial layer, corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, basal, which is technically how it goes from skin, outer skin layer, deeper. But that's one way to help remember uh, those layers. Come, let's get sunburned. Okay, uh, and the first three layers, essentially the basal or basali, some will say, spinosum or granul and granulosum are layers in co composed of living keratinocytes, and lucidum and corneum are uh, dead keratinocytes. So the stratum basal or basali, deepest epidermal layer, single layer of cuboidal, cuboidal looking uh, to low type col columnar cells, and you got your keratinocytes, your melanocytes, and your tactile cells. So with the keratinocytes, they're found in all layers. 
okay? And those in the stratum basal are large stem cells, and they divide to regenerate new cells. They synthesize keratin, and it's the protein that strengthens the epidermis, really gives us the strength of that skin as a barrier. And the melanocytes uh, are among the keratinocytes in the stratum basal. They produce and store pigment, right? Melanin in response to ultraviolet light. And they transfer pigment granules and melanosomes into the keratinocytes. And they shield the, shield the nuclear DNA from UV radiation. And then lastly, the tactile or Merkel cells. They're few in number, they're sensitive to touch. When they're compressed, they release chemicals, stimulate sensory nerve endings, okay? Uh, the next layer, second layer, the spinosum, there's several layers of polygonal keratinocytes. They're the daughter cells from the stratum basal that are pushed into that layer, pushed upward toward the uh, most superficial layer. Uh, there are non-dividing keratinocytes that are attached by intracellular junctions and known as desmosomes. And the epidermal dendritic cells, where you first find them here, uh, are also called Langerhans cells, are found in the stratum spinosum and granulosum, and they initiate the immune response. The other cell, in addition to the uh, uh, dendritic or the uh, tactile cells and the the uh, keratinized type cells that we mentioned before. Uh, stratum granulosum, the third layer. Uh, there are three to five layers of keratinocytes. They begin keratinization here in the granulosum, and they these keratinocytes fill with keratin, and the nucleus and organelles then disintegrate, and those cells now are dead, okay, as they move up into that fourth layer. That fourth layer is only going to exist uh, in thick skin on our palms and the soles of our feet. It's a translucent, translucent layer, two to three cell layers thick, uh, and it's filled with translucent protein known as elidin, or elidin, some will say. Uh, stratum corneum, the layer that we typically, well, that we do see, it's the fourth layer in thin skin or fifth layer in thick skin, but the most superficial layer that we all, that we have in all aspects of our superficial layer of skin, right? Uh, it's composed of 20 to 30 layers of dead interlocking keratinized cells. So those squamous cells are now very flattened at this point. Uh, and their dry thickened surface is protective against abrasions and infections. Uh, and these keratinized keratinocytes or keratinized cells are present for about a month before they begin to be there before they're sloughed off or shed at some point in that process or time frame. So we see here, uh, looking at the strata, get a little closer look here. For stratum corneum here, and seeing it more from a microscopic view versus you know more of a graphic representation here, stratum corneum, most superficial layer, both here, lucidum. Uh, being that one right right here and seeing it more vividly in the graphic representation, see a slight change here in that most second most superficial layer. Both these layers that do the dead keratinocytes. And you have a granulosum, okay? Remember, lucidum is only present, uh, in this case, what we're obviously looking at is thick skin, because in thin skin it wouldn't be present. And the granulosum below that, that third layer, spinosum, and the basal, which is usually not a very thick layer, okay? And dermis below that. So the variations of the epidermis, uh, the thickness, color, and skin markings, thick skin versus thin skin. Uh, thick skin, again, is palms of the hands, soles of the feet, all five layers. Uh, sweat glands are exist, they exist there, but no hair follicles or sebaceous glands uh, in, the thicker, in thick skin itself, in the lucidum, in the lucidum right? Because it's epidermis. Uh, and it's, uh, but it's all in the thick skin, there aren't any. You'll notice you don't have a lot of hairs coming out of the palm of your hand or the soles of your feet, right? Uh, and then the thin skin covers most of the body, they're everything everywhere else, essentially. It lacks a stratum lucidum. Uh, sweat glands, hair follicles, and sebaceous glands exist in that thin skin. Okay. Going through it, it's beginning from the dermis, of course. Actually, do we need to see it again? No. Okay. Uh, skin color. Normal color from hemoglobin, uh, melanin, carotene. Those are our three aspects that help give us our skin color. Hemoglobin itself is oxygen binding protein to the red blood cells, right? And it's a bright red color upon binding with oxygen. And then melanin is a dark pigment that's produced in the melanocytes, transferred to keratinocytes. And the amount in the skin depends on the variation in melanocyte branching. Not the number of melanocytes. Generally speaking, people have the same number, same number of melanocytes. The difference is the aspect of how much branching there is. So then, therefore, part of that's based on heredity, and part of that's based upon your ultraviolet exposure. And that'll give you dip, darker or, or lighter colored skin. Albinism is when the melanocytes are unable to produce melanin. They have the same an albine person who is, is uh, prone to albinism. Uh, it has the same number of melanocytes, they just don't produce the same amount of melanin. 
Uh, and carotene is a yellow-orange pigment that's acquired from some vegetables. It plays a role, obviously, in our, our skin and health of our skin. Uh, and then from a standpoint of the melanin with the melanocytes here, get a little closer look in here. So here we can see a melanosome here filled with melanin and the melanin pigment in the keratinocyte here, these little guys here, and the melanin pigment shown here. This is the melanocyte here with the branches coming out here uh, and showing that stratum basal right here, where it's kind of right here just above that dermis layer and the lowest layer uh, or the most deep layer, deepest layer of our epidermis. And as far as epidermis with, with uh, different skin markings, the nevus is a mole, and it's a localized overgrowth of melanocytes, essentially. And it should be monitored for changes suggesting malignancy. It's not necessarily a malignant uh, marking. It could simply be benign, right? But dependent upon the, the, the amount of UV exposure and heredity playing, again, a role to some extent in how much this will play a role with UV exposure, potentially uh, at risk for malignancy of these moles. Freckles are yellowish or brown spots. They depend upon UV exposure and heredity. You get to get more of them when you get older, potentially, or more exposure you get to the sun in addition to your heredity. Uh, there are localized areas of increased melanocyte activity. Not increased number of melanocytes, once again, but increased melanocyte activity. Uh, hemangiomas, hemangiomas are an anomaly of skin discoloration that are due to benign blood vessel tumor. Uh, capillary hemangiomas are strawberry-colored birthmarks. They're present at birth, and they often, they often fade over life. Uh, cavernous hemangiomas are more of a port wine color, uh, and they're, they basically are larger dermal blood vessels, and they potentially last uh, the whole lifetime, potentially. You can see them throughout life. Uh, friction ridges, essentially our fingerprints, right? They're large folds uh, in valleys of dermis and epidermis. They follow the skin contours, individual, very individual to each person. Uh, and that they're, they're, their increased friction that they cause on contact helps us with grabbing, and of course establishes our fingerprints. And here we can see an arch uh, versus a loop, and a, what's referred to as a whorl, and a combination of all of them in the whole fingerprint. From the clinical standpoint, look at UV radiation, sunscreens, and sunless tanners. Uh, the sun technically generates uh, UVA, ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, ultraviolet C radiation. Uh, the shortest wavelengths, the UVC rays, are absorbed, and they don't reach the Earth. Uh, sunscreens are, are trying to block out the UVA and the UVB. Only some UVB actually um, makes it through. Some is absorbed by the ozone. So essentially, it's really UVA we're really looking to try to uh, uh, block uh, or with our sunblock, so to speak. It protects the skin if it's used correctly. Uh, you know, you can have U SPF to some extent. It's let the SPF itself is questionable when you get the really high numbers. It's really a matter of so many things that are also based upon how much someone is sweating, how much moisture uh, is present, uh, someone's skin uh, from the standpoint of the melanin uh, from relative to their heredity, uh, also related to their current skin color, related to uh, the closeness to the sun, different parts of the, of the world. Uh, a lot of things can play a role with this, so that's why it's not a perfect thing to say certain SPF is going to protect everyone. But that said, it needs to be high enough to protect you. Generally speaking, 10 to minutes of sunlight per day uh, at least 15 minutes is really ideal for every human being, uh, where it's direct sunlight, not with sunblock or anything on it. But then again, you can make that argument depending upon someone's needs. Uh, sunless tanners uh, create tan skin without UV light uh, exposure. They interact with cell amino acids to help give you that tan color uh, without actually being uh, exposed to UV, uh, UV light. And it, but they only last for five to seven days, these, these sunless tans. Uh, and they're no protection against UV rays. It's not a sunblock. So what did you learn? As you trim your roses, a thorn penetrates your palm through all epidermal strata. What are the layers that epidermis penetrated? Well, there are all those five layers. You should be able to name that. Remember, um, come, let's get sunburn, <laughs> starting from the surface of the skin. I uh, briefly described the process of keratinization. Where does it occur? Why is it important? You should be able to do that. How does hemoglobin contribute to skin color? We just mentioned that. What's the function of friction ridges? We mentioned that as well. And we'll talk about the dermis uh, shortly.